name is Bruce Lieberman and I'm a professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Kansas and a senior curator at the Natural History Museum at the University of Kansas. I would define macroevolution as the patterns and processes that relate to the birth, the death, and the persistence of species. So it's really the patterns and processes that, that cause speciation, that cause extinction, and also that cause species to not change over long periods of time. Punctuated equilibrium is the notion that species, throughout most of their history at least, don't change. They show patterns of stasis, and indeed if we look at the fossil record, that's the dominant pattern that we see. So that's one very important aspect of punctuated equilibrium. Another important aspect, however, is looking at the origination of species. Based on the development of punctuate equilibrium by Niles Eldridge and Stephen J. Gould, they used ideas that were developed by Ernst Meyer that basically showed that most speciation happens in small geographically isolated populations. Populations that we would say are allopatric. And it's the fact that those populations are generally isolated and small that makes change relatively rapid, at least on geological time scales. So your average species might persist for five million years or so, but the speciation event in which a new species was produced would probably be, take on the order of about 5,000 to 50,000 years or so. So really, punctuated equilibrium combines the notion that rates of evolution vary with the notion that speciation usually happens in a small geographically isolated population which is really the conditions that encourage it, rapid evolution, but also conditions that mean it's, it can be harder to find individual speciation events in the fossil record. So one of the real challenges to punctuate equilibrium, or the reason why people didn't understand it initially, had to do with the definition of what was gradual change and what was rapid change. For instance, in the fossil record, 5,000 to 50,000 years is really just a blink of the eye, incredibly rapid. In contrast, in the modern ecological world, 5,000 years is, is very slow, and that's a lot of time, and that's gradual. So part of the argument between people who advocated for punctuated equilibrium and those who opposed related to the fact that what meant gradual to one group of people, biologists, was something that would be rapid to paleontologists. So that was one aspect of the debate. Another aspect of the debate, however, is that different types of species show different intervals for the amount of time speciation takes and also how long the average species lasts. So for example, if you're looking at your average marine invertebrate, which forms the great majority of the fossil record, for example, trilobites, I study trilobites, and probably an average duration of a species of trilobite might be five million years. By contrast, uh, the average duration of a species of vertebrate, like a, a deer or a fossil hominid, would be more on the order of one to two million years. So across different groups, the amount of stasis, or the time of stasis, did vary. And one of the things that Eldridge and Gould really emphasized in the punctuated equilibrium is that the time speciation took was relatively short compared to the total duration of the species. That is to say, if speciation takes 5,000 to 50,000 years, that's pretty darn sure, whether uh, the species lasts a million years or it lasts five million years. I mean, it's, it's less short for a million year species, of course, but it's this relatively long duration of stasis compared to a relatively short interval of speciation change. I work on trilobites, and I like to say that I love trilobites because they're such beautiful organisms, so so pretty, so spectacular, but that's not the only reason I work on them. I work on them because they're a great scientific system as well. They're incredibly diverse. Many people may not realize it, but there are probably about 20,000 species of trilobites that are out there. Uh, for a very long period of time, they were the dominant organism, at least in the oceans, and I think that too is fascinating to think about how 
that group of organisms that was once dominant is no longer with us. So like that's what inspired me as a child was was things like dinosaurs and and also other charismatic things like trilobites that have unique distinctive anatomies. And it's also the fact that they have such unique distinctive anatomies that makes them good subjects for the for, for phylogenetic analysis, for the tools that we use to relate evolutionarily different groups of species. Because they're morphologically complex, it means that they're beautiful to look at. It also means that they're they're good for the purposes of scientific analysis. So I think it's that combination really of aesthetics and, and, and sort of thinking about deep time and how life has changed so much, yet at the same time the prodigious diversity and the, the great number of morphological features that makes them such good candidates for study. We know that there are processes that operate at the smaller scale and these lead to patterns at the larger scale. However, there may also be processes that operate at the large scale that contribute to those large-scale patterns. And what the original Neo-Darwinian synthesis, where it missed the boat, if you will, is originally it, it, it took kind of as a, a tentative proposition and then later a, a definitive assumption that microevolution and macroevolution are equivalent. They must be related. And I think, really, the connection comes at the level of speciation. What goes on at the population level, how do we relate that to what goes on at the species level? And I think that's why there's still room for developing a new synthesis because scientists in different areas concentrate on different hierarchical levels and different processes, all of which are valid and it's really piecing together how those individual processes work that we come up with a bigger picture about evolution. Really what was lacking in the Neo-Darwinian synthesis was a focus on development, a focus on paleontology, a focus on systematics. Really, it became just about population genetics. And what operates at the population genetic level and the processes they discovered were very important for explaining that level, but they could not necessarily explain all of the other patterns. And, and that's why we know that the synthesis was incomplete because the way we test theories is, is by looking for patterns. And the processes that were focused on at the microevolutionary level were insufficient to explain all the patterns. They explained some, but they didn't explain all. So I think there is room, and I think s schools like this one are important because they bring together people in different areas, and it's that exchange of ideas it's the exchange of ideas that led to the first Neo-Darwinian synthesis, and I think it's that exchange of ideas that ultimately will lead to a new synthesis too. That hopefully has a greater emphasis on macroevolution and paleontology and systematics. Hierarchy theory is, is really based on the notion that processes that might operate on one level, for example the genetic level, might be very different from the processes that operate on the species level. And why this becomes really significant is because many biologists have tried to suggest that, hey, what's going on at the genetic level is the only thing that matters, and we can just extrapolate those processes from the genetic level all the way up to explain the entire history of life. But in reality, because nature itself is, is hierarchically organized, What's happening at the genetic level might explain very well what happens at the organism level, but it's processes at the organism level that explain what happens at the population level, and processes at the population level that explain what happens at the species level. So hierarchy theory is important because it, it recognizes that biology is complex, and in reality, Physics has for, long, for a very long time recognized how the world is hierarchically organized and that processes that operate at very small scales may not explain how the large scale universe works. So I think the introduction of hierarchy theory to biology follows very nicely with the tradition in physics. For example, we know that in terms of what keeps an individual atom together, there are four major forces, and it's the strong force which is strongest at the scale of the individual atom. 
So if we used a, a classical extrapolationist view, we might predict, hey, it's the strong force within Adam that determines the structure of the universe. But in reality, it's gravity. So gravity doesn't play a big role in determining how the atom is organized, but that the grand scale of the universe, and galaxies, etc., are, are, are organized in where they sit. It's that force that's very weak at the small scale that plays the biggest role at the large scale. So I think the incorporation of hierarchy theory really is, an, is partly an appreciation of the world is hierarchically organized, it's complex, and you can't explain a complex system using a very simple principle.